Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Colin Bryan. I'm chairman of the Voice of the Listener and Viewer. And it's very uh, good to know that so many of you are there. Just a couple of um, uh, house rules, as it were. If in the worst case scenario, we lose or you lose the, the, the picture, just uh, turn off and then dial in again using the same link that you used to get on first time. If you want to ask a question, uh, do submit it on using the chat, for, uh, sorry, the Q&A symbol, and we'll try and get to your questions if we can. Although we have had a lot of questions already uh, put in in advance, and I'll be trying to cover those with the Minister. So that we welcome the Minister. We're delighted that he's able to come and talk to us at such a, a, a busy time for the department. Uh, as you well know, uh, that it's John's uh, second stint at the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, having previously been Secretary of State there. And of course, he also had a, a long term, 10 years, I think, as the influential chairman of the Culture, Media and Sport Select Committee. So welcome, John. Um, can I just actually start by asking you, I, I realise that sport is not actually precisely part of your brief, but uh, were you at Wembley last night? No, sadly not. Um, I, I was lucky enough to go to the game against the Czech Republic uh, last week. Um, but uh, no, I, w I, I was working uh, yesterday because it's slightly earlier in the day, um, but I definitely had it on in the background. Yes, uh, it was. Uh, I'm sure everybody else will have had a, a great time watching that. So uh, good, uh, a good way to start the session, I think. OK, well, look, um, there's a, a lot going on at the moment, in, as I mentioned in my brief introduction. Is there anything you want to say by way of in, introductory comments, John, or will we move straight to the questions? Uh, well, I'd just say, I mean, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to come and speak to the voice of the listener and viewer um, who, you know, as you said, I've been doing media policy a long time and we've always had a, a good relationship and I value you know, the contribution that you and your members have made. Um, I, I wanted to postpone this session just for a, a short while as obviously um, there are things happening and now we're, we're able to talk about uh, for instance the uh, consultation we're launching on channel four uh, we're in the middle of the discussion with the bbc about the level of license fee and of course we're having the more general view uh, of the future of public service broadcasting where we have a panel uh, that is about providing advice. So um, there's quite a lot going on uh, in the sort of media space. Um, and so now I think it's a good time to have this discussion. Yeah, indeed. I think also, in addition to the ones you mentioned, there's uh, on-demand re uh, regulation. Uh, there's the PSB review generally. There's the HFSS ban, uh, which obviously impacts the, the, the revenues of the uh, commercial PSBs. You've got hopefully legislation for prominence, et cetera. Um, can I just check, is all of this going to come together in a white paper in the in, in the autumn, John? How is that um, most work? of those things you've mentioned, yes. Um, you know, we, we are, the PSB panel um, is sort of working its way th through the process, uh, will be providing advice to us as, of course, uh, will Ofcom in the next stage of their examination of the future of PSB. And we've had a... Uh, a, a useful select committee report. So there's a lot of different strands um, and we'll be having a consultation, as you know, which we're launching very soon about the future of Channel 4. So yes, I think come the autumn, we will be hopefully in a position to bring a lot of those things together. But the one of the area which you mentioned, which is separate and actually you know, is, is being introduced um, by the Department of Health rather than us is the HFSS uh, measures. OK, but uh, you, you mentioned, obviously, there will be consultation on Channel 4 and on all these issues. Will there be, from our point of view, it, it's extremely important that viewers, uh, that citizens have the opportunity to input into these decisions? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, the, the, the Channel 4 consultation is an actual invitation to people to submit views and there will be a process for that. I mean, some of the other issues like, I mean, prominence has been discussed over a quite a lengthy period. Um, and obviously Ofcom has been doing quite a lot of work around that, but you know, we would be always interested to hear views about that. VOD um, potential regulation, again, is a, is a relatively new area where we have said we are looking to see 
uh, what kind of regulatory requirements we might wish to place on the streaming services. And, and again, you know, we'll, we'll always be keen to hear views on that. You um, mentioned the, uh, obviously, Channel 4 privatisation. That's been um, arguably the, the highest profile announcement over the last couple of weeks, that, that consultation. And not surprisingly, members have submitted quite a few um, questions on the subject. Um, for example, Professor Silva, Sylvia Harvey asked simply, what are the arguments for and against the privatisation of Channel 4? Uh, and uh, what would be the benefits of citizens if, private four, uh, if Channel 4 were privatised? And then uh, Professor Vincent Porter has asked uh, about the remit, and several, several members have raised this. Um, would it, can we expect that a privatised Channel 4 would have the same remit? as the existing Channel 4? And is that a reasonable expectation in the context of a privatised Channel 4, which obviously would be focused on making profits for its shareholders rather than investing in content? So how, how would the remit be affected in the, in the event of a privatisation? Well, these are all questions which form part of the consultation. Um, I mean, if we decide that it is right to change the ownership structure of Channel 4, the reason for doing so is to strengthen Channel 4. Now, the question, the first question you raised, you know, what are the arguments for, what are the arguments against? Um, one of the arguments against, which has been put by some commentators, is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it is true that Channel 4 has performed extremely well in the past. It has actually managed to weather the difficulties caused by the COVID pandemic pretty effectively by, you know, taking action uh, to cut the amount they were spending on content right at the start, so that um, the drop in advertising revenue, which inevitably took place, um, didn't sort of push them in, into a deficit. Um, but the reason we're looking at it is, is not because Channel 4 is performing uh, badly now, but because we do think that in the longer term, that model is going to come under increasing pressure. I mean, Channel, Channel 4 only has essentially one form of revenue, which is advertising income. And as you've seen, you know, linear TV viewing is falling. There are more and more new entrants coming on board. You know, you've now got at least four or five big streaming services with more potentially about to arrive. And that is going to you know, compete for viewers which inevitably is going to affect the advertising. So it's over the longer term. And one of the things which we uh, think um, any of the broadcasts are going to need to do to hold on to uh, their viewers is to be able to invest in content. Now, you know, it is unlikely that Channel 4 or indeed even the BBC are ever going to be able to spend the kind of sums that you know, Amazon are now spending or Netflix are now spending in terms of uh, TV content, but you know, if, if Channel 4 and the BBC have a good record of providing very distinctive and successful programming, um, but they will need investment to do so. And one of the uh, reasons why we're considering the future of Channel 4 is because potentially if they were no longer uh, publicly owned, that would firstly free them from the constraints uh, which inevitably exist on a publicly owned company from borrowing. So as a, 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 a privately owned company, they would be free to go into the market borrow, but also they, they could become part of a, a, a company which is able to invest in content in a way that they simply can't at the moment. Um, and I, you know, this is, this is not in any way yet decided. There are a number of different options, but you know, I would point out, for instance, what has happened in Channel 5 where Channel 5 obviously was UK owned, but didn't spend a great deal of money on content, was not terribly successful, was acquired, and actually has since its acquisition been able to invest in you know, programming, and as a result has become a much more successful channel. Channel 5 has done well, and it produced a, lots of, a lot of good PSB material, absolutely. But it's arguably somewhat more populist, if you like, offering than uh, some of Channel 4's activities. So I come back to my question about the remit. Absolutely. Uh, you know, that remit is greatly valued by viewers. I think it should be greatly valued by, by citizens as well. And one wouldn't want that particular remit to be uh, lost. I mean, are there red lines, for example, and things that, that could, uh, couldn't be changed by a new owner? 
Well, I mean, the remit comes in several parts. Um, there are the quantitative requirements placed on Channel 4 and indeed other public service broadcasters, which are around things like the, the amount of content that is commissioned from production companies outside of London. Um, so there are very, you know, very, very strong requirements, which actually Channel 4 has generally exceeded in most areas, but they are quantifiable, they're measurable. But then there is on top of that a much more qualitative uh, part of the remit, which is this requirement to be edgy, innovative, distinct, appealing to minority audiences. Now, you know, it's, it's quite hard to measure that, but the aspects of a remit are part of the consultation, but that's not necessarily because we want to abandon them. I mean, it may be that, you know, the remit was set at a time when essentially there were only uh, the BBC, ITV and, Ch and Channel 4. So it was serving a completely different purpose then. You've now got a wealth of content. And so it may well be that the remit needs to evolve. And that's something we are keen to hear people's views and to include in consultation. It might even be that we would wish to strengthen the remit in some areas. Um, so the remit is part of the discussion, but there is no question in my mind of abandoning the remit. Um, you know, Channel 4 is going to remain a public service broadcaster. Um, and part of being a PSB is that there are these uh, obligations placed on them and Channel 4 has very specific ones. <clears throat> Just in looking at the potential reasons for changing it or moving into the private sector, is there a risk in actually thinking of Channel 4 as in, in just as a linear terms? Because it's been very successful in developing its, its digital offering, arguably the most successful of the UK broadcasters, and indeed grow, growing its digital revenues. So it's, it doesn't follow that just because linear is declining over time, uh, that Channel 4's advertising uh, revenues will therefore decline because it is proving at the moment very successful in uh, developing new advertising streams through digital. That is true. But, you know, I, I, Linear TV is only a, a relatively small number of, of um, pro content providers. As people move, you know, more and more into the digital world, as more and more people switch to IPTV, then, you know, they are suddenly presented with this wealth of content. Um, and so I think it, it, it is inevitable. Now, I would not argue with you that Channel 4 has invested in digital uh, platforms uh, and has proved relatively successful in attracting audiences to its digital channels. But there is no doubt that every broadcaster is going to have to make that adaptation and that requires investment. And, you know, it's going to be ongoing investment. And I've been talking to other broadcasters who equally recognize that, you know, you need to uh, invest in uh, digital if you are to sort of remain competitive in this new sort of landscape where we're working in. Um, and so all of them are looking for finance to do that. Um, and obviously, you know, the BBC has been very successful in developing the iPlayer, which are, you know, ha has achieved uh, a lot of success. But you know, I'm talking to other broadcasters like, for instance, S4C, who uh, equally have digital ambitions. Um, so, you know, it, it, this is the new world. You, ca you cannot remain linear. Yep, we understand that completely. And uh, so, well, I think on, on Channel 4, we'll certainly look forward to the, uh, the consultation with, uh, with great interest. But you talk about the new world and you mentioned the move to IPTV and so on. And it makes me wonder, where do you stand on digital terrestrial television? Because we, we feel that in uh, the context of PSB, and in particular now in the context of BBC, uh, the concept of uh, universality is extremely important. That is delivered primarily at the moment by digital terrestrial television, and obviously a move to IPTV, uh, IPTV is by definition, uh, potentially at least, a move away from universality. So what's the, what's the government's commitment to the, uh, to the future of digital terrestrial? I mean, Colin, you, 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 in the introduction, you said that I've been doing this job a long time <laughs> in, one, in one capacity or another, and you're absolutely right. And when I first became chair of the DCMS Select Committee, which was back in 2005, the very first inquiry I conducted was into analog switch off. And there were yeah. all sorts of sort of uh, forecasts of, of 
the disaster that would follow. Analog switch off actually was reasonably successful. But as you'll remember, the government did have to pay to send engineers around to help people who you know, found it difficult to retune their TVs or to fit boxes or whatever. Um, and a move to IPTV, which is happening, you know, because people are generally more and more going to be um, connected to broadband, they're buying smart TVs. But you know, the, the, the stage at which we have reached such a high penetration that you could even contemplate um, switching off DTT is, in my view, still a long way away. Because if you switch off DTT, it means that you have to have an internet connection and a, and a fast one in order to still be able to access TV. And, you know, there are, the government is rolling out our gigabit broadband um, package, which, you know, hopefully is going to uh, make broadband universal. But of course, not everybody has chosen to adopt it. Um, there are some people who, who feel they don't need it, or they're perfectly happy with, you know, the existing uh, channels they can get on DTT, and they don't want to pay, you know, maybe 20 pounds, 30 pounds a month for a broadband connection. So I think we're still quite a long way from that. I think the time will come, um, but you know, we, we, we certainly aren't setting a date at this stage. Um, and you know, lots of people keep saying to me, why can't the BBC be funded by a voluntary subscription model? Well, one of the answers I always give is you couldn't even think about that until we moved to IPTV because Freeview doesn't allow it. So, I mean, all these are issues, but before we can even contemplate it, you are absolutely right. We would need to have, be at a point where everybody could, you know, would get fast broadband and essentially had chosen to do so. So does that mean you will be awarding the new 10 year um, DTT multiplex licenses? Yes, we're, 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 we're all sort of looking at that at, at absolutely at the moment. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's certainly, um, you know, I, I don't see any uh, chance really of a, a switch off um, in, in for probably, you know, at least well, probably 10 years or so. Yeah. Okay. We've come by a slightly circuitous route to uh, talking uh, in a sense about the BBC as well, in terms of the um, universal availability of the BBC as a, as a free to air service, uh, which we regard as important. Could I just clarify your views? You, you've said very clearly, it's not possible in the short mm. term to, to think in terms of uh, voluntary sub subscription or any other kind of subscription for the BBC. Um, but is that something in the longer term you do you do have in mind? And what would be the implications for the concept of a universally funded, universally available service, which seems to work pretty well for 100 years? Well, I mean, I've, I've always thought the licence fee has all sorts of drawbacks, but, you know, we looked at it when I was chairing the select committee, I and mean, I looked at it as the Secretary of State who um, oversaw the Charter Review, and we concluded that, you know, for all its flaws, it was... Uh, still the best way of funding BBC and therefore the license fee is sort of the, is set until the time of the next charter review uh, which will be in 20 you know 2027. Um, as part of that I think there will be a debate about the future uh, of the license fee um, but as I just said you, you can't move towards a subscription model until you have the technology in every home which allows you um, to have a, a, a system whereby you can choose whether or not you want to receive the BBC, and that doesn't exist at the moment. So, um, you know, there are various other options for funding, but but at the moment, you know, the licence fee is set, um, and the you know the model won't change. But you know, I think inevitably, as more and more people do um, acquire IPTV, then that is a debate which is bound to take place. You mentioned, uh, mentioned the license fee, and of course, you're, I think, pretty well in the middle of discussions with the BBC at the moment as to the uh, level of the license fee for the, the second five year period of the present charter. Now, how's that going, and when, when can we expect to hear something? Well, I would hope you can expect to hear something quite soon. I mean, you know, obviously, we're talking to BBC. The BBC have ambitions, um, you know, they, which we share. Um, and 
Well, BBC is an extremely important asset to this country. I mean, not only is it much valued by you know, viewers in the UK, it also has an international reputation, which is probably stronger than almost any other uh, broadcaster. Um, and we do want to support and sustain the BBC. But equally, you have to recognise that these are extremely difficult times. Uh, you know, many people are having to accept that they're not going to get a pay rise because the country you know, obviously has had to, to incur huge costs in order to deal with the COVID pandemic. And you have to take account of the, you know, the context um, when reaching a decision. So we, we aren't yet there yet, um, but you know, we are engaged with the BBC and I hope that we will reach an agreement you know, reasonably soon. Reasonably soon being before the uh, parliamentary recess? Um, well, I mean, it, there is a process that has to uh, be undertaken um, and, you know, it, it may require, um, you know, some parliamentary uh, approval in due course. But yes, I mean, I, I, whether or not we are able to do it for the recess, which actually is not that far away, um, I'm not sure. But, you know, I, I hope that we can do so relatively soon, but I don't want to sort of make a firm commitment yet. OK. And um, also in context of the BBC, we've got the midterm review coming up. Um, at the time of the new charter, it was stated the midterm review would be essentially about a review of governance and whether governance was working. Is, um, is that still the case? It is still the case. Um, when we drew up the charter, as you know, we put in place a completely new governance structure. We created the BBC board um, and at the same time we um, put in place an external regulator of performance of BBC in the form of Ofcom. That was, well, that was the first time that it happened uh, and we said we would want to have a midterm check to see whether it was working um, and that was the purpose of the midterm review. Now of course what has happened since then is that we have had um, the report by Lord Dyson, which has exposed some quite serious concerns around the way in which in the past governance of BBC has taken place. Uh, when I made a statement in Parliament about this, I said that, you know, I, I think we hoped that the changes we made uh, in 2015-16 would have meant that the failures that undoubtedly did occur would, could not have taken, uh, would not have occurred under this new structure, but that's something which we can't be absolutely certain of. And um, Tim Davey and Richard Sharp quite rightly have set up a review under Nick Sorota, the senior independent uh, board member. Um, that review is underway at the moment, and it may well result in recommendations uh, to change the governance structure. So there is a, there is a good reason why we need a midterm review, I think, um, to make sure that some of these uh, problems that did occur in the past cannot occur in the future. One of the one of the points that has been raised, I think, in that context, in the context of Dyson, was the establishment of a, a separate editorial committee that might be created, uh, suggested by Lord Reid, I think, uh, among others, which would sort of investigate editorial independence and content uh, before or after transmission of content and be, be separate from the management structure. Is that the kind of idea that you would? Be interested. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I've talked to Michael about it, and I think it's an interesting idea. Um, I mean, there is a, a, a sort of parallel in the way that Ofcom operates, where you have an Ofcom board which oversees all Ofcom's activities. You know, which range from allocation of spectrum to wholesale pricing of telecommunications, right through to content regulation of broadcasting. Um, but beneath, beneath the Ofcom board, there is an Ofcom content board, which is specifically tasked with um, looking at difficult editorial matters around TV content. So, you know, that works reasonably well. I'm not saying that that necessarily is the best way for the BBC to structure itself, but that's something which I'm sure Nick Sorota mm -hmm. and um, it seems Hargreaves and, and Robbie Gibb uh, will be looking at to see whether or not there needs to be greater oversight of the editorial decision making because you know the, the the Bashir interview of Princess Diana is not the only um, failure in 
recent years by the BBC on editorial matters. You know, we look back to the Savile time, um, Lord McAlpine, and, and, you know, there have been a succession of editorial problems. So it may well be that they will conclude that stronger editorial oversight is necessary. But in the first instance, it is right that the BBC look at that, which they are doing, and then we'll wait to see what is the outcome of the Sorota review and whether or not, for instance, that might require some tweaks to the charter. Mentioning Michael Grade reminds us that he's on your PSB panel, your advisory panel, uh, which you chair, which the Secretary of State set up. There have been some concern among the PSBs, I think, that the membership of that panel um, doesn't contain, if you like, a spokesman for the PSBs. Uh, it looks as if it may be made of people with perhaps vested commercial interests to an extent and wouldn't want to exaggerate that too much. But the concern is, I think, principally that um, all their hearings, the discussions with you, the six meetings are, are in private. We're not really clear exactly what the terms of reference are and there'll be no report published on the basis of the, the, the outcome of their conclusions. And as you know, we at the VLB are very keen on greater transparency, uh, greater accountability. This seems to be a fairly unaccountable, opaque uh, arrangement. Well, what I would say is the PSB panel is not taking any decisions. Um, the PSB panel is a group of people who bring considerable knowledge and experience. Uh, we deliberately decided it wouldn't be right to have as a member anybody who has a current uh, job or role with uh, any of the PSBs. But having said that, several members of the panel have got a lot of experience of having worked for or alongside PSBs. I mean, you mentioned Michael Gray, obviously, who you know, is a former chief executive of Channel 4, a former chair of the BBC Trust and a um, mm -hmm. former chair of ITV. So, I mean, he's pretty much been around all the PSBs. And there are other people like John Hardy, who, you know, was editor of ITN for a, for a long time. Um, so they do bring a lot of knowledge and experience, but they are there to provide advice to the Secretary of State and myself. Um, and the actual decision making will be by us, um, you know, listening to the PSB panel, but also listening to the select committee who produced a, a very good report and listening to Ofcom who are doing a lot of detailed work. So there are a lot of different inputs, but at the end of the day, it will be uh, ministers who decide, and I'd absolutely no doubt that you know will, there will be debates in Parliament and, and further opportunities to for people to comment on what we eventually decide. More generally, on on transparency, I mean, we've been very keen once again looking at the BBC funding for it to be a more open and transparent process. Um, the Select Committee, indeed, also called for it to be a more open and uh, transparent process. It looks like the process has improved a bit this time around. It's not last minute meetings behind closed doors and in dead of light or whatever. But nevertheless, um, there hasn't really been any element of public consultation at all. Is that something that you regret? Well, I mean, I, I think it is a lot more um, open than it was last time, because of course, obviously it was me who did it last time. But when I, I became Secretary of State in 2015 and within a couple of weeks, George Osborne, um, came along to me and said, you know, I, I'm facing a significant challenge in terms of bringing down the deficit. Um, you know, you're going to have to, uh, the BBC is going to have to play its part, which is why we, we had the decision which was taken at that time around the funding of the over 75s um, TV concession. This time, you know, it has been a much more um, structured process at the beginning of it. The Secretary of State set out the uh, criteria and asked for the BBC to provide um, evidence to us in terms of the funding they required in order to meet each of the public purposes, which is set out in the Charter. Um, and there has been a, a, a much more um, structured engagement with the BBC over that. But at the end of the day, um, you know, this is a negotiation which you know, can't be conducted mm -hmm. with an audience sort of sitting watching every every uh part of the debate but we have endeavored to ensure that you know people have had the opportunity but we've set out clearly what are the major criteria which will be used to decide um the level that is um, appropriate uh, and you know there have been a lot of people who've expressed views about that 
as you, as you know, I think we've done some research and it's now uh, public that uh, public revenues, license fee revenue for the BBC has basically declined by 30% over the last 10 years. And I think there's been calculation by Enders Consulting and others that uh, the BBC would need a, an, an RPI plus two settlement just to fulfil the plans that it has set out for the future and not to have to cut services further. Is, is that a... Is that a reasonable kind of figure to be thinking about? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't want to sort of get into figures. I mean, I would say, I mean, it is, the BBC obviously went through a period uh, when the licence fee did not increase. Um, at the time that we reached the last settlement, we agreed that uh, we would go back to an RPI <laughs> increase. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there were other measures taken alongside that, some of which supported the BBC, like, for instance, the closing of the iPlayer loophole, others of which has have imposed some cost on them, like the over 75s. Um, you know, the BBC still benefits from an, a, a huge amount of revenue from the licence fee, you know, three and a half to four billion pounds comes from the licence fee, and then you've got the income from um, commercial activities on top of that. Um, so, well, this is a well-funded broadcaster. Now, you know, people will say, yes, but look at how much money you know, Netflix or Amazon have to spend or Sky or the rest. But equally, one has to keep in mind that this is a compulsory tax which people are required to pay in order to fund the BBC, overwhelmingly to fund the BBC. Um, and therefore, you, know, you, you, you cannot look at it without keeping in mind that you are going to be asking people to pay more at a quite difficult time in many people's economic situation. That sounds like nothing about RPI then to me. Well, as I say, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, to sort of speculate at this stage. I mean, we are, we are involved in the <laughs> negotiation with the BBC and you know, I hope we'll be in a position to say something about that relatively soon. Thank you. We, uh, we mentioned Ofcom, and um, one of our members, uh, John Clark, has raised the point that the, the process for reappointing the chair of Ofcom seems to have been a, a bit of a mess. It would appear that the selection panel put forward names, but none were deemed appointable. And there is now going to be a further process, possibly with one of those candidates who is deemed non-appointable being included again. Can you just let us know what's happening? It's not a, it hasn't been a very edifying process, has it? Well, I mean, part of the problem actually, I think, arose before that in that um, the number of applicants we received was relatively limited uh, and didn't sort of achieve the ambition we had to have quite a wide and diverse range of candidates uh, from whom to choose. So um, the Secretary of State felt that particularly because you know, the oversight like committee had flagged up the need for um, a, a, a diverse range, uh, and it is one of the requirements, uh, that we wanted to uh, undertake the process again in order to get as wide a range of, of, of possible applicants as we could. Um, and so that, that's why they decided to um, reopen the process. Uh, but again, I, I don't want to sort of comment beyond that because we're, we're in the middle of it as we speak. Can I just uh, take a couple of um, specific questions that have been sent in before I take some of those that are being uh, sent in at the moment? Um, Je Jeanette Stevens, one, one of our trustees, Professor Stevens, says, can you explain why funding for the Young Audiences Content Fund pilot was cut by 25% this year? when there's evidence that it's helped support increased production of PSB content for children? Well, I mean, the Young Audience Content Fund um, was, in a way, my sort of brainchild in that yeah. um, I was very keen um, that we um, have a, 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 a pot of money funded by the licence fee to support content which was underprovided, and that specifically was children's programming. Um, and also um, there's a, a, a smaller chunk which is used for audio content, radio uh, commissions. Um, I mean, it was always there for a, a period and, and it has been very successful in my view 
Um, and, and it still represents quite a significant intervention now. But you know, again, that's going to be something which, looking forward, we're going to have to um, think about as, as because it is license fee uh, payers' money. Yes, and top slicing of the license fee has been one of the issues the, the BBC has faced over the last uh, decade or so, and it's not something we, we, we would prefer this to be new money, not, uh, not uh, robbing the license fee. I, I, I understand that, but you know, we have to accept that you know, the, the financial constraints on government are considerable. We have a huge deficit somehow to try and pay off, and it's going to take us a very long time. Uh, but, you know, obviously, COVID has imposed costs on government, unlike anything that any government has had to bear since probably, you know, the last war. Um, and so, you know, that, that is the economic climate in which we are operating. So, I mean, I don't think, you know, sadly, DCMS is going to suddenly find a pot of money. So the licence fee was used the last time. And we also have to bear in mind that the licence fee, as I said, is primarily there from the BBC. Um, but you know, also S4C um, is funded by the license fee, and that is a part of the separate negotiation that we're having um, in order to determine the appropriate level of funding for them too. Yes, indeed. T Tim Wilson has sent in a, a question about S4C funding. Uh, as you say, I think that's been looked at separately for the first time. Uh, can, can S4C expect a a good settlement to stimulate the further growth of the, the, the Welsh culture and the, the Welsh creativity? Well, the government is absolutely committed to Welsh language broadcasting um, and S4C. Um, now, in a sense, you set a licence fee, which is a, a single payment into a pot, and if you give more money to S4C, that obviously takes more money out of the pot, which leads less for the BBC. So, you know, it is a balance. Um, but as I say, you know, that, that's all part of the negotiation. We are having separate discussions with S4C about what is the appropriate level of funding for them. But you have to keep in mind that, as I say, every extra pound S4C gets is one less pound for the BBC. Um, and so it's quite a complicated process. But we are absolutely committed to sustaining S4C, um, and that, that's something which, you know, I, I've had regular discussions with them and with my colleagues in the uh, Welsh Government and in, in Whitehall. Thank you. That, I, I could go on with this for a long time, but let me now take some of the questions that are being sent in as, as we talk by participants in the audience. Uh, looking at these, Holly Elliott says that in Germany and Norway, Oversight of funding of the main public service broadcaster is done by an independent body, not the government. Could the government look at this model? And I think in the past, the VLV has suggested something a little bit similar, that this, we, we have suggested there should be, at the very least, an independent body that advises government in a public kind of way what the funding should be. Is that something you would consider? Well, I mean, I think I, I certainly went to look at the way in which Germany funds its uh, public service broadcasters when I was in the select committee. And actually, they moved to a, a kind of household tax. But I mean, it, it is the case that, you know, ultimately, this is a tax which people have to pay. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think it's right that in setting um, a, a, a level of uh, the license fee, it is done by elected uh, representatives in the form of the government. Um, you know, I mean, I don't think you can um, hand it over to uh, a, an independent body, um, which is not elected and not accountable. You know, we ultimately have to determine what you know we we think is right to ask people to pay. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't see uh, there as being any likelihood uh, of changing that. I under I understand completely that ultimately it will be the government's decision. But the concept of a, an independent body to recommend something, and that could then be debated in Parliament, in the interest of transparency, is not is that not an idea that uh, commends itself? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't think necessarily it adds anything um, because you know the BBC put up the case as to you know how much they think they need and to fund you know whatever ambitions they have. Um, and then we obviously scrutinise that. We talk to them about 
um, you know, whether or not there is opportunity for greater efficiency, whether or not um, you know, the, the, their strategy is the correct one. Um, and that, that is a very detailed discussion. Um, and you know, some of it is obviously quite commercially confidential because you know, the commercial activities of the BBC make quite a significant contribution to their uh, funding. Uh, and I'm not sure you know, that they would be able to um, sort of open the books and allow an independent body just to crawl all over them. I mean, they already do have uh, audit uh, by the National Audit Office. Um, so to that extent, they do have an external body looking at the way in which they spend their money. Okay. Um, question here from um, John McVeigh. I'm sure you know he's the Chief Executive of PACT. Indeed. When the government publishes its consultation on the future of Channel 4, will this include the government's evidence and market impact assessment on its potential privatisation? Um, it's a consultation. Um, so, you know, I mean, a lot of a, 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 a lot of the potential impact, if you like, will be the consequence of whatever decision is taken. Now, you know, I mean, John, who I know extremely well um, and has been an outstanding advocate for the independent production sector, you know, he will be very conscious of the uh, support that Channel 4 gives to Indies across the country. That is part of the remit. And as I say, the remit is something which is part of the consultation. So, you know, at this stage, we can't conduct an impact assessment because we haven't reached any decisions about what is the appropriate way forward. Um, at some future point, you know, we, as a result of the consultation, we will come back and say, right, these are the changes to the remit which we think um, are appropriate if, if that is the outcome. And indeed, this is the ownership model which we are uh, think it offers the best way forward for Channel 4. But at this stage, none of those decisions have been taken. Yes, I mean, presumably there needs to be a market impact assessment before you can determine what the best route is. Uh, the, the two seem to go together. Well, I mean, obviously we have, you know, our own uh, internal government advisors, but you know, the, the most basic questions about, you know, if, if a, an alternative ownership model is appropriate and what changes um, should take place to the remit are issues that we, you know, we, we are inviting expressions of view. We are not anywhere close to reaching any conclusion yet. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we've got a call, uh, sorry, a question here from Adam Sher uh, Sherwin of the I newspaper. He says 20 million people, I hadn't seen the figure yet, 20 million people watched the England game on BBC One last night. Does that show the importance of terrestrial channels having access to national sporting events free to air, even when they might not be the highest bidders? Um, well, the government, as you know, has always had a list of specific events which are reserved for free to air broadcasters. Um, we're not proposing to remove anything from the list, but nor at the moment are we proposing to add to it. Um, I mean, I think you have to bear in mind that you know, sports broadcasting has provided a, an enormous amount of money into sport, which you know, wasn't there before. Um, and also, um, no, there, is, there is no compulsion. If you, if, you, if you say to sport, you are not on the list, which means you have to sell um, to a free to air broadcaster, it doesn't mean that they have to sell to a pay-per-view broadcaster or a subscription channel. Um, you know, it, ultimately, it's up to the sport, and it is a balance. You know, we've always recognised, or sporting bodies have always recognised, that on the one hand, you know, they want to maximise the revenue which they can invest in developing the particular sport. But against that, it, you know, it, it, sports need big audiences to sustain uh, them and to attract people into the sport. And that is a balance. Um, and that's in each case, it is for the sporting bodies to decide what is the appropriate balance. Um, now, you know, for instance, the Premier League has been able to uh, achieve uh, enormous revenues from a you know, succession of, of deals, which you know, we've been pressing them over many years to invest more into grassroots uh, football, and they, they are doing that. Um, but that would not have been possible if they hadn't had access to the kinds of money which they've been able to raise from sports broadcasting. So you know, I, I've always felt that whilst there are a limited number of events which it is appropriate to, to 
have on free to air. Um, beyond that, are actually the best people to decide are the sporting bodies themselves. Okay. Um, question from Bob Usherwood. Um, does the minister think that GB News meets the due impartiality and due accuracy guidelines as set out by Ofcom? Well, um, I mean, I was listening to a discussion um, of GB News, I think, um, about a week ago, which Kevin Backhurst was taking part in, and Kevin, as you probably know, um, looks after content regulation for Ofcom. I saw and that he, debate as well. Yeah. He, and he, he said that he had seen nothing which caused him any concern over uh, GB News meeting the impartiality requirements. I mean, as we know, you know, it, it, impartiality is a difficult concept which uh, you, you need to reach a judgment. It does not require you uh, to stop any broadcaster expressing views, but that has, does need to be balanced over the course of the transmission. But if you look at, you know, let's say LBC, uh, you know, you have uh, broadcasters on LBC with very strong opinions, uh, which they express, but they've got a range of commentators who hold widely different views. Um, and I think, you know, it, 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 it is, I think viewers actually probably appreciate having provocative views expressed as long as it doesn't turn into a propaganda station. Uh, and I don't think there is any sign of GB News doing that in the same way that um, and there is any other broadcaster. And, and Ofcom you know, will step in, as we've seen, uh, for instance, over um, broadcasters like RT and, of course, most, re most recently, um, CGTN, which you know, had, had its license actually removed. I guess the question is whether you need impartiality in a particular programme, across a programme, or whether if you achieve impartiality or balance by having a range of different programmes. But of course, the issue there then is that the viewing figures or listening figures may vary a lot. So it's a, a potentially, I guess, it's a slippery slope. Well, I mean, you're absolutely right that that is one of the debates. And, you know, Ofcom have a lot of experience in doing this. I mean, not always, I don't always agree with the decisions they've come to about programmes. Um, but, you know, equally, I think that, you know, I would, I would not want to have uh, broadcasters prevented from uh, having people expressing strong views. Um, and as long as, you know, they are challenged properly and that there is uh, a, a broad impartiality. Um, and I think it depends, you know, um, obviously I think the PSBs have a greater duty and particularly the BBC, which has impartiality written into the top line of its public purposes, uh, you know, the standards there uh, are, are perhaps even stricter, be going beyond the Ofcom requirements. But, you know, every broadcaster in the UK uh, requires a broadcasting license issued by Ofcom and impartiality is one of the requirements of that license. Um, Stephen Barnett uh, of uh, Westminster um, wants us to go back to the appointments process for Ofcom. Uh, Stephen says that the government knew who the candidates were when interviews were being conducted. And if the concern was about diversity, why was the process not abandoned at that point when the, um, when the candidate name, names were already known? And can we therefore be confident that the successful candidate will not be an older, white, middle-class, privately educated male? <laughs> well, no, I mean, they, we want a wide range of candidates from which to choose. You know, we don't want necessarily to um, decide the outcome before we've even undertaken the, the, the interviews. Uh, but as I say, this is an ongoing process and I, I, don't, I don't want to uh, get drawn into, um, you know, discussion of, of potential applicants and, and what uh, might be the outcome. Uh, you know, it, 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 there, is a, there is a process. Uh, we have an external uh, commissioner who, you know, makes sure that the process is conducted properly, which he has vouched that it has been and, and is being. Uh, and, you know, I hope that we will be able to reach an appointment you know, relatively soon. Okay, thank you. Um, Martin Stott goes back to the issue of um, Channel 4 consultation and ask, will maintaining the status quo be an option in the Channel 4 a consultation? Well, I mean, as I say, no decision has been taken. So, yes, to that extent, 
yeah. you know, to that extent, if, if, if we decide that, um, you know, the, the, the Channel 4 model is sustainable going forward, um, but, you know, I mean, the government has made it clear that we are minded to move to an alternative uh, ownership model because we are very conscious um, of the constraints that uh, public ownership places on Channel 4. Um, it prevents Channel 4 from having access to the markets to borrow money. Um, it doesn't have an owner that is likely to be in a position to invest in it. Um, you know, at the moment, it's entirely dependent on advertising revenue under its present uh, ownership uh, uh, structure, uh, which is very limited. So the government has indicated that we think there is a strong case for an alternative ownership model, but you know, that doesn't mean that we have absolutely decided that that is the case, otherwise we wouldn't be having a consultation. Okay. Um, Chloe Harcroft uh, mentioned something which perhaps I should have raised as well. You touched earlier, but can you, sorry, you touched on this uh, slightly earlier, but can you please explain the key areas of Ofcom's proposals to regulate streaming platforms? and increase PSB prominence in the UK. And just on the prominence point, I think Ofcom actually made its recommendations best part of a year ago. So waiting for government to actually turn those. Uh, I, 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 I'm very conscious of that. And indeed, every time I talk to, you know, the PSB channels, you know, be it, be it ITV, Channel 4, uh, BBC, I mean, they raise it with me. I mean, part of the difficulty is that to uh, make amendments to the, um, requirements on prominence requires primary legislation. Um, and, you know, you, you, as you know, government whenever is always a huge number of competing um, issues which need to be addressed by parliament and it's a question of finding legislative space. Now, you know, we have said that we hope to be able to introduce a media bill in the next session, and that will address both of the, those two issues, the one around uh, prominence, where undoubtedly the fact that the way in which people access TV is changing. Um, you know, I was having a discussion yesterday about the fact that smart TVs, um, you know, in particularly some manufacturers, the PSB channels are not uh, right up the top and it's actually quite hard to find them. Um, so prominence is not working if you, if you have a, a, a smart TV and use that. Um, so that's something which is part of the need to address the issue around prominence. And in terms of streaming services, um, certainly we felt that you know, there are quite strict requirements on the PSBs uh, in terms of um, things like age appropriate warnings around the complaints process for harmful content, etc. And none of those apply um, for the streaming services, which obviously are attracting more and more viewers in the UK. So we think there is a case for uh, putting, not necessarily as strict requirements as the PSB channels have, but at least some requirements on the streaming service as well. You've got a channel like, uh, or a service like Netflix, which does use the British Board of Film Classification rating system, uh, which is very welcome and, and commendable for them to do so, but, but it's their choice to do so. Not all of the other services do that. Um, and they don't have to do it, so you know, they could drop it tomorrow. I think there is a case for requiring um, some kind of age-appropriate uh, labelling uh, for services, and that would be, for instance, one possible area where we would be looking to uh, impose some requirements on the streamers. Just on the looking at requirements, and we're almost at the end of our time, uh, but um, obviously it, there's something of a deal between the PSBs uh, and government and that get prominence. PSBs are expected to um, deliver their obligations, to deliver their quotas. We've had some concern that the PSBs seem to be pushing a bit towards, um, instead of having quantitative quotas, having more qualitative um, assessment of the, uh, whether they're meeting quotas or not. And that seems, I can understand the arguments for it, but the, the great thing about something quantitative is you can absolutely measure whether they are doing enough education programs, enough, et cetera, et cetera. I wondered whether you had any concerns about that move as well. Well, it's a, it, that's a matter which um, primarily is the responsibility of Ofcom, but I do talk to Ofcom about it. Um, I mean, I, I, I am also conscious that 
um, particularly around the BBC, for instance, uh, you know, they are um, operating in a, in a world where there are commercial competitors who, who are very sensitive to the BBC sort of trampling into their space, which is why there are particular requirements imposed by Ofcom on the BBC um, and which requires them to assess, you know, the market impact of any new services. Um, now, the way in which Ofcom um, measure the delivery of the PSB obligations is ultimately um, for Ofcom, but it is also one where Parliament's made very clear um, the requirements which it expects the PSBs to meet. Um, and, and so far, you know, I mean, I've not seen any evidence that they're failing to do that, but obviously that is something which we would keep under review. Thank you, John. I think we're at the end of our time. Uh, as you know, we, we the VLV support the PSB strongly, so we'll be following the consultations over the, the various consultations over the next uh, few months with great interest. We'll be maintaining our uh, good liaison, which we have with officials and regulators, and trying to make sure that at all times that the citizens' view, the viewers' view, the listeners' view are reflected in these decisions, because ultimately that, I think, is, is what matters most. It's certainly what matters most to the VLV. Was there anything that you wish to say by conclusion, John, yourself? No, I mean, it, it, I mean, I do think, you know, it is right that all these issues are under debate, but we have to recognise this. It, I mean, this is an incredibly exciting time if you happen yeah. to be a listener or a viewer. Uh, you know, we, we haven't talked about listeners and, and, you know, what's happening in radio, uh, but that too. You know, there, there are massive changes taking place. Um, but ultimately, it is the listener and the viewer who benefit because, you know, we have a greater range of outstanding content from which to choose than at any time before. And there's somebody who enjoys both radio and TV. You know, I mean, that is a fantastic benefit to, to, to all of uh, your members and the wider population. Thanks, Sean. I would encourage our members to get in touch with us as ever if in these ongoing uh, negotiations, consultations, you have particular concerns which we will aim to reflect. I would encourage those of you who are on this call this morning uh, who aren't members to consider joining the, the, mem uh, the membership of the VLV. And I'd just like to conclude by thanking you, John, for the time you've given us this morning and the uh, very open and full way in which you've answered our questions. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks, Thanks very much.